All right. So Philippians chapter two, the one that some some uh, scholars refer to Philippians chapter two as the Jesus poem, or at least the first part of Philippians two here. So, um, and we we talked a little bit about what this was not where Paul expected to end up. Um, even back when he was journeying um, in the book of Acts, where the area is, he sees the man in his dream calling him to come to Macedonia. And when he shows up, he doesn't find any man at all. He finds a group of women down by the river praying. Um, And it would seem that made up a lot of the church at uh, Philippi, where this area was. Um, and it was just a great reminder how uh, it's not always what we think. Um, Paul had that dream of a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help, and it wasn't what he thought when he got there. And sometimes the Lord does the same thing with us. He'll call us to something or call us to some area, uh, and it's not what we think when we get there. It's not, it may not be what, what we dreamed. There may not be a man, or the, uh, what we might have thought. Um, and so that's kind of just a great reminder for us, um, being sensitive to the Lord's calling. And not. And we'll talk a little bit tonight about not, uh, not what we want, not our own dreams or our own desires. In fact, the, those things are to be set aside. And Philippians 2 um, is very just near and dear to my heart because it's what teaches us what Jesus was like. There's few chapters like this where you get a, a sneak peek into the attitude and the mind of Jesus. Um, not so much His actions. We, we read through the Gospels, we see what Jesus did. But this, you get a little bit into his mind, what the thoughts that Jesus had, um, which shows us, actually, the mind of God, which is really powerful. Um, in fact, that's a question everybody asks, and it's a good question. What is God really like? What's God like? What's he all about? Even atheists ask that question, and they don't even believe that there is a God, but they want to know what he's like. <laughs> um, And Philippians 2 is a very simple answer to that basic question. What is God really like? Let's find out. (laughs) So verse 1, we'll read verse 1 through 11 of Philippians 2 and just drop back and look because it's a big, there's a lot here in in this first section. So um, Philippians 2 verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, and let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, mind, let each esteem other better than themselves." Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
the Father. So, um, Paul's desire right off the bat like a lot of his letters to a lot of the churches, was uh, this call for unity. Um, it's an area that we always have to come back to. It always convicts us. And I think in the church, more than any anything else, especially even growing up in the church, um, you have church splits, you have disunity within the body of Christ. Um, and Paul's desire ultimately for the church was to see them brought together. It becomes actually a little more clear once we get to chapter 4 of Philippians. We learn that there's actually two women there in the church, um, Euodius and Synthe uh I forget how to say, Syntyche, I think, or, uh, are the two women. And we'll read about them in chapter 4. And we're not sure what they argued over, but they had some argument, some division there in the church. This stuff happens in churches. It still happens. And the, unfortunately, it's the reason we have um, so many different denominations, so many different churches. It's, it's insane, the amount of churches that'll be in one city. Um, and I think for the longest time, it... it, it uh, baffled me how that could be but then you get to know people you start to see there's different types of people that gravitate towards different types of things whether it's hymns or rock music or pews or chairs or children's programs or having the whole family sit together um, there's just people that that like different things, and it's totally okay. It's uh, it's not. Uh, it, I think it's a great reminder that um, God loves to use the differences that we have in each other, um, the different people that He brings together. The amazing thing is the like-mindedness that Paul brings up. Um, he found people like-minded, like him, and and we do too. We we end up finding people that that are like-minded, and ultimately it's the mind of Christ that we're after. That's what we, we're desiring. Um, and that word if in verse 1 can be confusing in the English language because it's better, more rightly translated since. Since in fact there is <laughs> consolation in Christ. Since in fact there is fellowship of the Spirit. So we think of if, that word, we think it's a question, um, but it's not. He's making the statement that there is, and since that be the case, and that's why since is just a better, better translation of that, that word, that since there be uh, consolation in Christ, since there's comfort in lo of love and, and fellowship of the Spirit, fulfill my joy. It's like this stuff should already be happening in the church. Um, but we end up butting heads. We end up kind of uh, dividing, uh, bringing up things that really are secondary issues, not, as, not really essential for saving grace. Um, and it can be tragic. It really can be a tragic thing. Um, when people actually divide over over small things like that, um, Paul makes a list of some sort <laughs> comfort, um, and I just wrote down some of these de definitions. Um, te talking with others in such a way that calms them down or brings peace uh, when you deal with people. Um, Fellowship. He also talks about fellowship. Uh, koinonia. Oneness. Close relationships. Sharing. Um, all of these things are just, just again, defining what these things are. Uh, consolation is comfort. And then fellowship that we see in verse 1. Um, and bowels is actually affections. 
deep feeling even deep down in your pit of your stomach. Um, having a heart for others that actually, this is where it becomes vulnerable for us in the church. Uh, because if you really do love anything, you're vulnerable. The, the, your heart can break. Um, your feelings can get very crushed. Um, and that's, that's where this whole idea of the bowels, the affections, the very deep part of us come, come in. We really do honestly, sincerely care for one another. Um, and then we're going to see later on, uh, or actually that's it for that list. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's how, that's how, ver or sorry, mercies. There it is at the end of verse one. Mercies. Don't forget that. Um, also could be compassion for others, pity, uh, realizing that we all deserve punishment, um, all of these things all together bring unity. Um, when we truly experience and truly have comfort, uh, consolation, fellowship, and the, the uh, affections or bowels, and then mercy. All of those things bring about this one mind, like-mindedness that he talks about in verse 2. That we would be like-minded, having the same love, and being of one accord and of one mind, verse 2. Um, again, it's very hard. Uh, the world has tried over and over and over again to achieve this. To be totally one. <laughs> to be completely in unity. Um, not, not divided. Not arguing or argumentative but agreeing with one another on things. So, where Paul got all of the idea comes from Jesus, doesn't it? Uh, for, the, for everything he's been talking about in Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, he gives this incredible um, insight that we read already, but it's, it's good to go through this slowly and see... Um, let, well, verse 3 goes on. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Do not bring attention or pride to yourself. Do not lift yourself up. With Facebook, with Instagram, with TikTok, with all of the stuff that's out there, this is happening at an enormous rate in our day. Um, it's why people do it, is vainglory. If you want to see what vainglory looks like, you can see it in many sports games. Um, you know, uh, just the, the dances after the touchdown. or the That's the idea with vainglory, but it happen, it's happening at an even more... You don't have to be a superstar now these days. Um, everyone seems to be tapped into this whole thing. And we don't need help. We don't need help in this area. We are already vain people. Very, you know, uh, prideful, arrogant. We just are, naturally. If we take a picture, right, a group picture of all of us, and I hand that picture to you, who are you going to look for? Who's the first person your eyes go to? It's, it's yourself. You want to see what you look like. And we, that's, that's just a natural thing. Everyone, every one of us does that. And so don't bring attention to yourself. Uh, stop thinking so much about yourself and what other people will think about you. That's defining, and again, I'm just, I'm just clarifying what vain glory is that he brings up in verse 3. This is why this, this chapter is really heavy. It's packed full of stuff that will convict anyone. <laughs> um, uh, but in lowliness of mind, this is kind of the, the uh, counter to it. This is how we, we are not vain glory. We're not, we're not like this. In lowliness of mind, we esteem others better than ourselves. Which, by the way, that's not hard to do. To look at someone else 
and say, you're better than me. It's not hard to do, but we never do it. We never do it. We always want to be better than the other person sitting next to us. The fact of the matter is, no matter what or who that person is, they're better at you, they're better than you at something. Whether it's math, whether it's maybe art, there is people all around us, <laughs> us sitting in this room right now, you're better than, than me at something. And it's good for us to acknowledge that, yes, that person is better than me. That person is better than me. Way better than me. I could never knit something. I could never, you know, whatever it might be. We always fixate on one thing, and we want to master it, and then we want to be the best. Again, that's a natural desire. We naturally do this. But for us to look and to really acknowledge, that person's better than me. It's good. It's a good thing to do. Our society, the way we're raised, we're not taught to do that. If anything, we're taught to step all over everyone, use everyone. Uh, somebody said we, we've got it backwards. We use people and we love things. We're supposed to use things and love people. For some reason, we end up using people a lot of times to get things, and then we love things more than people in some cases. <clears throat> so, let nothing be done in vain glory. In lowliness of mind, esteem others as better than yourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but, on, but every man also on the things of others. This one I've got in my notes to uh, a great illustration of this is somebody, you know, in the parking lot, and you've been waiting to take that, that open parking spot. And the guy just, just pulls out, and someone comes right in and zips into it. And the first thing we, we, we think right away, what a jerk. What a total selfish jerk. Or somebody cuts you off. Same type of thing. You're, the first thought is, that's, that's awful. What an awful human being. What a total self-absorbed jerk. And if we actually stopped, if we actually stopped and took times took time to look into the things L look into that thing oh that guy just lost his wife that guy just got fired that person just you know that it doesn't excuse the behavior but what it will do actually looking into that thing that matter whatever it might be it will cause you it will cause me to be compassionate where before I was judging, I was looking down on them, I was thinking I was better than them. I was all kinds of things that, that happen in life that all we would have to do is stop and look into the things of other people. We're always about our own thing, man, because we know our own thing, <laughs> whatever's been going on. But look not every man on his own things. Verse 4 is pretty huge. It's a hard one, too. <laughs> but every man also on the things of others. Look into what other people are, are into. And we learn from verse 5 how, how important and vital this whole thing is because let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Again, back to what, what I was saying at the beginning of the study. This chapter is so precious because we get to see how Jesus thought. We get to see why he did the things he did. Um, he thought like this. He put others' needs before his own. He looked into others more than his own thing. And ultimately he, I think verse 6 is one of the most essential, basic truths that we need to always come back to, and that's that Jesus is God. In verse 6, it words it in such a way that who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, God has no equal. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. 
And so, wait a minute. Jesus Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God? Well, if he wasn't God, <laughs> there is no equal to God. And so, that, that's a huge statement. And it's not the first time. John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus tells Philip, I and the Father are one. If you've seen the Father, I mean, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do we know what the Father is like? We look at Jesus Christ. And uh, there's a whole list <laughs> um, of just basic scriptures that very flat out declare Jesus is God. For all the cults that try and teach, no, he was the son of God. Um, all of those different things that, that, that kind of skirt around the issue. I think it's important for us to, to know. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. You could jot that one down. These are just great to know and to have these offhand. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. Again, very basic stuff, but powerful. <laughs> Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. <laughs> Romans 9.5 Pretty dang clear, Jesus Christ is God. And then there's also uh, 1 John 5.20 Um 1 John 5.20 Very clear again. And we know that the Son of God is come, that's Jesus Christ, is come and has given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Pretty dang clear there in 1 John 5.20. I think that's the clearest verse that I've come across. And of course, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Titus 2, 13. We look for the blessed hope. Um, where's Titus? It's right after Timothy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Titus 2, 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior... Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus 2.13 um, Again, just very basic, straightforward scriptures that will, will tell you um, that Jesus Christ is God. Even doubting Thomas, um, doubting Thomas would say in John chapter 20, verse 28, My Lord and my God, when he saw Jesus finally after doubting that he had risen from the dead, remember? Um, so Thomas declared that Jesus Christ is God. The, the religious leaders um, desired to stone Jesus and put him to death. Why? Why did they want to stone Jesus and put him to death? Because he claimed to be God. And Jesus was, he, he is God. <laughs> and so the, that's such an important thing to, to always come back to. Um, and verse 7 goes on about Jesus. Back to Philippians 2, verse 7. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, <clears throat> that, that word form, I meant to touch on that a little bit because it's in verse 6 and it's also in verse 7. And that's being in the form of God. And then in verse 7, he took on the form of a servant. That word form is actually the essence, the very nature, the very def defining who God is. That's, he took on the form of God. It's not he put on a costume and dressed up like God. That's what sometimes we read the word form and we can think that. No, he, he really is the essence of God. And he took on, verse 7... The essence of a servant. In other words, he made himself of no reputation. What's that mean? Not at all desiring to leave some legacy behind in this world. 
not at all worried about reputation. Imagine, no reputation. That's, that's selfless. That is the ultimate selfless. Because no matter who we are, we always desire to leave something. And that doesn't necessarily make us selfish, because a lot of times it's to our kids or something like that. But to, to, to really get into the mind of Christ again is it was all about others. I mean, his whole life, everything was about others, someone else, not me, even his own uh, reputation. He was totally, and nobody cares <laughs> where a servant came from or where a servant is going. In fact, the real, uh, a servant's job is to make someone else's life better. That's what a servant does. That's a servant's duty. And, and again, just defining what a servant is, is someone that makes life better for someone else. Um, in other words, dying on a cross so that someone might live. That's making someone else's life <laughs> like infinity times better than the hell that we would face otherwise if it if he did not come um so jesus ultimately was someone who made himself took upon this form of a servant i also wrote down john chapter 13 we all should remember in john chapter 13 where jesus shows us what a servant shows the disciples what a servant is and that's getting down and washing the filthy, smelly, dirty, disgusting feet, especially of one of those disciples, Judas. And Jesus actually taking time and doing that act. I mean, every time I read John 13, every time I come across that and remember it, <laughs> you know, talk about a servant. It's incredible. So why, you know, why it's so important for us to understand this is none of us, we, we must learn how to be servants. None of us do this naturally. None of us, it doesn't come to anyone naturally to be a servant. We serve ourselves. You can look at my kids <laughs> when they're young that's what they're programmed to do. They shovel whatever they find in their mouth, thinking that will serve themselves. Some of that will, some of it's edible, but others can be harmful. But we, we just want that for me. Whatever it is, we, we serve ourselves. Well, Jesus, to the, the greatest degree ever, served others and always looked to make life better for someone else, not his, not himself. Um, to the point, being found in a fashion, uh, sorry, verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Um, it's, the glory of Christmas season is that Jesus Christ became a man. The incarnate deity was the phrase in that great song that we sang. And that means deity, God Almighty, made in the flesh. That's incarnate deity. He's made flesh. And that describes Jesus Christ. Jesus became the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, it's funny because Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all have their way of, of in the story of we go to Bethlehem, we see Mary, we see Joseph, we see the, the angels, we see John the Baptist, we have all the, the uh, background of the Christmas story. 
And everyone says, well, the Gospel of John's kind of like, where's the Christmas story? It's one verse, and it's that verse. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John never takes you to Bethlehem. John never points out that Mary was a virgin. In John's Gospel, his whole thing is to let you know that the God of the universe, God Almighty, is Jesus Christ. And he came in the flesh as a little baby, born of a virgin. <laughs> and, and it gets the point across. And it's, it's incredible that even the, the beginning, the opening line of that light of the world, you stepped down into darkness. That is the whole story of, of really of Christmas, what Christmas, what we're going to be celebrating very soon. And that's that Jesus Christ came to this earth and, and became human, took on himself, took on this, this uh, likeness, this form and fashion as a man. He humbled himself. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua. That's Jesus. In, in uh, the New Testament, in Greek, Jesus is the Greek name for Yeshua, or Joshua. And that's God is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. That's what Jesus is. That's what Jesus, the name, and, and we know that it's the essence of his name. And every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, people will bow. People will confess. We do it gladly tonight. We, we gladly bow and say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And we confess it with our tongues. People are cursing his name and using his name as a curse word. And they don't bow the knee. They spit. <laughs> but they will. One day, they will. Every knee will bow. And it's, it's so important that we understand Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of all. We don't make him Lord. He is Lord. It doesn't matter if we bow to, to him or not. It doesn't matter if I confess him or not. He is. I think we forget that sometimes. He doesn't need any one of us to help in any way. He is. In fact, that's another name of God. I am. Not I was, not I will be, but I am. It's the very uh, nature of God. That he, he just is. And somebody said it wisely. You can fill in the blank with whatever. Because we want uh, other things to fill our needs. But Jesus Christ is. I am. God is what you think you need. <laughs> we think we need this. We think we need that. We go chase after this. We chase after that. Jesus Christ is the love that I think I need. He's the affection that I'm looking for. He is everything we ever need. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. I mean, you can really fill in the blank. He's our provider. Everything. It's incredible. <laughs> and uh, Paul is reminding us not to be selfish, uh, to stop thinking about ourselves and to think about others and to look to Christ ultimately. Looking to Christ, the one who's author and perfecter. Um, this is another great quote here. Every single part of your body is a servant to the other members of your body. Your physical body. Your brain serves a purpose, and it's for your heart that also serves a purpose for your whole system. Every part, all the members of our body 
serve one another. And it's, it's the way God has designed it, but it's how the body of Christ is to function. Serving one another and being servants of all. The, the disciples, the reason this is so huge, the disciples were known and became known, sadly, they, they became known for one thing, and it was arguing. The disciples, over and over and over in the scriptures, they just argued. And what did they argue about? Who was the greatest? That's the whole thing of humility. That's Philippians 2 here. This was written after the disciples. <laughs> they didn't have it to look at. And what I love is Jesus tells them how to be... The, he doesn't scold them about arguing about who's going to be the greatest, he, which is what I would do. It's what most people would do. He doesn't even bring that up. But he actually says, you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Be the servant of all. He sh and he didn't just tell them, he showed them <laughs> how to be great in God's kingdom. So to truly be great, <laughs> learn how to serve, serve others. Because humility does bring unity. When we learn how to be <laughs> humble, God gives us grace. In fact, He cannot impart grace. He cannot give His grace to you unless you first humble yourself. We know that from James 4, 6. We know that from 1 Peter 5, 5. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In fact, it's, it's huge, this whole idea of humility. The, the uh, Naaman uh, in the Old Testament, the, the man stricken with leprosy, he was healed because he finally humbled himself and went down to the river that he kicked against. He, he wanted to just go against it. One of the, the, the worst kings of Israel, Ahab, one of the most vile kings in Israel's history. I mean, served other gods, got everyone in the nation of Israel to forget about the living God. And listen to what God, the living God, says. Um... To Ahab, because of this whole thing of humility, it's pretty powerful. First Kings, chapter twenty. You just jot it down, or chapter twenty-one. Sorry, First Kings twenty-one, verses twenty-eight and twenty-nine. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah the Tishbite, and saying, "Seest thou how Ahab humbles himself before me?" Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his day, but it will be in his son's day that I bring the evil upon his house. God withheld judgment <laughs> simply because Ahab humbled himself in 1 Kings 21, verses 28 and 29. God will give you grace if you humble yourself. You're not as bad as Ahab, I promise. <laughs> and if God gives Ahab a break, any one of us can, can, can uh, stand for it. Any one of us. Um, another thing about having the mind, because it says, let this mind be in you in verse 5. It, it could also be attitude. Um, and sometimes we need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> to be quite frank. We just need a different attitude. Um, outlook. A mindset. The way that we think, the way that we kind of go about our day. Um, we need to be like Christ, and that is putting others before ourselves. Um, having an attitude of gratitude. Having an attitude that is thankful. Um, 
again, I know all this stuff is very basic, but we need to hear it. We need to be reminded of it because um, it's always incredible to me how we can complain, we can murmur. That's going to be next week because Philippians 2 goes on and it kind of makes this connection with murmuring, with complaining, with arguing. Um, and this whole idea of unity and humility. Because at some point, we know, at some point in any relationship, somebody has to say, you're right, or I'm wrong. <laughs> somebody actually has to die for there to be any kind of, and I mean, I mean spiritually, not physically. <laughs> Sometimes, actually in some families, it's that bad where the bitterness, the resentment, the arguing, it will not be until the father, the mother, the grandma, the brother, the kid dies physically. And all of a sudden there can be some kind of reunion, some kind of... of uh, um, the mother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> there could be some kind of embrace and where they're forced almost to talk to each other. Don't ever let it come to that. But it's sad. I've seen that firsthand, where people haven't spoken to each other for however long, and it's at a funeral that they finally <laughs> either resolve or they confront. And it's yeah, it's not it's not pretty. Time does not heal. In fact, time will make things very very hard. Time does not heal. I hate that saying. Time will heal all. Scar, no, don't sweep it under the rug, deal with it, confront it head on, don't let time pass, because it only makes things worse, waiting. But, to really do that, somebody has to be <laughs> um, humble, that's, that's what I'm, that's the word, humble. <laughs> somebody has to truly come along and say, I'm nothing. And I really am putting your needs, your feelings, your self over my own junk. Whatever it is. Myself. Over my own thing. It's, a, it's amazing how we forget. We forget. And I'm the first to admit. We forget that we are truly just mud. Like we are mud clods. And it's amazing how much money people will spend to make their mud look good. You know, and they show it off. People advertise, come to us, come to us, we're going to make your mud look real good. And they do. And people spend all kinds of money. But we are dirt. We are mud. We are just, that's, that's what we are. In fact, the worst thing that any, anybody does, the worst thing that our society does to, to people is start to think that you're something when you're nothing. In fact, that's one of the biggest lies of psychology, of, of uh, therapy, of any kind of, of program that might be out there. And it's teachings of men. But it's the lie that you have really low self-esteem and that you know, you're in danger of suicide. You could, you could be thinking and having these thoughts of, of harming yourself. Well, suicide, ultimately, suicide is the most selfish thing anyone could ever do. That is the most single most selfish act in all acts of all time. And so, yeah, <laughs> you might think because you have such low self-esteem that, that you need to work on your thing. And actually... Building up that self-esteem will only make things worse, ultimately, for that person mentally, emotionally, all of it. And in fact, it's a spiritual thing. Everything is. I don't know if you realize that. Why people are uh, have mental disorders. Why people have uh, just any, any kind of disorder, any kind of uh, illness. It's a spiritual thing. There's spiritually something going on. 
And so <laughs> getting at the root of the problem, getting it to the root of it is always, it's, it's difficult for people because they've been, they've had all this garbage shoved down their throats thinking it was helping when actually it's distancing, it's making it so much worse in the long run. They're, they're that much further to coming to God. Why? Because it takes humility. It takes actual, well, like Isaiah in the throne room of God, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm beside myself. I, I, I'm so unworthy. I'm filthy. I'm disgusting. That is healthy. In fact, that will happen to every single one of us when we come in the throne room of God, ultimately. If that's not happened, then it wasn't authentic. It was another God. <laughs> because when you're in His presence, when you're before Him, and you truly give Him that reverence and worship and adoring and just sitting at His feet, that's what comes over me. That's what should come over us. Biblically, that's what happens. I am nothing. You're everything. Why me, Lord? <laughs> and it's incredible. It really is. But Jesus Christ, the most perfect human being to ever walk the planet, thought himself as nothing. In fact, had no reputation. In fact, found it found you worthy to die for. Found me, these mud clods, <laughs> worthy to die for. <clears throat> he loved us to death. It's incredible. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, how good and how gracious, how loving you really are. And we can only respond in worship. We can only respond appropriately by just singing and praying and spending some time just uh, just worshiping you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word this evening, Lord, how powerful it is. Help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus so that the things of this world, the things of earth, would just grow dim in light of your glory, of your grace, Lord.